round golden soybeans. Packed with protein, they have been called the meat of the fields. Soybeans are full of vitamins and minerals. Even outside Japan, they're in the spotlight as a miracle food. The Japanese started eating soybeans around 2,000 years ago. People devised many ways of eating soybeans that suited Japan's climate and culture. These efforts gave birth to food items such as miso, tofu, and soy sauce, which became staples of the Japanese diet along with rice. The people who grow soybeans and the people who process them are the inheritors of finely honed skills handed down from generation to generation. In Japan, soybeans are believed to have sacred power to ward off evil and have long featured in seasonal rituals. On this edition of Begin Japanology, we look at soybeans, a staple of the Japanese diet, and also at the ingenuity that gave rise to a remarkable variety of soybean products. Hello and welcome to Begin Japanology. I'm Peter Barakan. Our theme for today is the humble soybean. I'm in Kyoto, which is famous for its tofu, which of course is made from soybeans, but we'll get into tofu in more detail a little later in the show. People all over the world are turning to soybeans these days as a kind of health food, but they've been around in Japan for hundreds and hundreds of years, and their history actually tells us quite a lot about Japan's culinary traditions. Let's start off with a look at how soybeans fit into the whole scene of Japanese food. Soybeans are a superb health food, containing beneficial proteins and fats and lots of minerals. In the West, they have historically been grown mainly for their oil and as livestock feed. By contrast, in Japan, where animal protein was traditionally very scarce, the full potential of soy has been exploited. Open the fridge in a typical Japanese household and it's virtually certain that you will find numerous soy-based products inside. Japanese supermarkets are chock full of processed soy foods, as you can see. I love it! I eat it every morning. My body demands it. In what forms do soybeans find their way onto Japanese tables? Let's take a look. First, as a seasoning, this is soy sauce. Special bacteria are mixed with steamed soybeans and roasted wheat to make a substance called koji. Salt water is added to the koji. Then the mixture is slowly fermented and aged. The resulting liquid is soy sauce. Soy sauce is widely used in all phases of cooking, from preliminary preparations to final seasoning. It brings out the savouriness of food and adds a distinctive flavour and aroma that is integral to Japanese cuisine. Next, miso. Like soy sauce, it's a seasoning the Japanese cooking can't do without. Soybeans are steamed with rice or barley. Then table salt and koji are added to the mixture which is left to ferment. A broth is made from miso paste. Together with seasonal vegetables and local delicacies, this makes the quintessential Japanese home-cooked soup, the ubiquitous miso soup. Our next example is made by fermenting the beans without altering their shape. This is natto. There are two types. This is the salty type. The soybeans are fermented using the same special bacteria used for miso, then dried and aged. It's said that in the 8th century, Buddhist monks returning from China brought this food to Japan. Most of this salty type natto is still made in Buddhist temples. Here's the other type, sticky natto. 
This is the type widely consumed in Japan. Sticky soybeans are fermented using the natto bacillus. The traditional method of making this natto is to steam the beans, wrap them in rice straw, and keep them at a temperature of 40 degrees Celsius. Left for about a day, the microbes on the straw colonize the beans and ferment them to produce a characteristic, sticky, stringy texture. Let's take a look at the usual way of eating natto in Japan. First, you stir the beans thoroughly. The trick is to keep stirring until plenty of sticky white strings form. This stirring boosts the savory constituents, making the beans taste better. Natto is usually eaten over rice. When you lift a mouthful of natto with chopsticks, sticky strands will hang from them. If you wind these strands up with the chopsticks, you can keep them from sticking around your mouth. That lets you eat them neatly. Finally, tofu. In Japanese cuisine, tofu can be anything from a main dish to an ingredient in soup. Let's watch the tofu production process in which nothing is wasted. The tofu maker's day begins very early. First, the soybeans are soaked in water. In making tofu, the selection of beans is of critical importance. The origin and variety of the beans subtly affects the flavor and firmness of the tofu. Beans are living creatures, or so tofu makers say. So the soaking time is adjusted according to the weather and temperature. They say that no matter how experienced a tofu maker is, every batch will come out slightly different. The following morning the beans are checked, and the day's process is calibrated. First, the beans are mechanically mashed while adding water. Next, the mashed beans are cooked in a boiler. The liquid extracted when boiled soybeans are squeezed is soy milk. Soy milk sets into tofu. The tofu making process also generates several other food products along the way. First, okara. This is what's left after the soy milk is squeezed out. Okara is often eaten after being simmered in sweet soup stock. When soy milk is heated, a skin called yuba forms on the surface. Skimmed off, Yuba can be eaten as a delicacy with soy sauce. In order to produce tofu from soy milk, a coagulant is used. The coagulant comes from the process of evaporating seawater to obtain salt. The making of tofu uses all of the bean's nutritional potential. One popular summertime tofu dish is hiyayakko. Chilled tofu is dressed with condiments and soy sauce to make a tasty treat. And in winter, the typical tofu dish is yudofu. Tofu is warmed in a pot and eaten with a soy sauce-based dip. In summer or winter, soybean-based items play a big part in recipes as main dishes or seasonings. Soybeans are highly nutritious and have been incorporated into the Japanese diet in many forms, making a useful contribution to everyday health. This part of Kyoto is called Fuyacho, and it used to be full of shops selling tofu and yuba. There's a shop here that's been in business for many years and still makes tofu in the traditional way. I'm going to go in and take a look. Hello. Soy milk coming out of the bottom here. What are we seeing here? The fiber contained in soybeans mixed with water.
Care for some soy milk. Thank you very much. Wow, it's a very mild taste. It's, it's quite thick. It's very pleasant. It's also very hot. Soybeans are an annual crop. They're sometimes called the meat of the fields in Japan and gold from the earth in the US. In Japan, more than 80 varieties of soybean are grown. Let's observe how soybeans are cultivated. Seeds are sown between April and June. Over the summer, the pods become plump with green beans. At this point, they're called edamame. By boiling them, the beans themselves can be eaten while they're still young, that is, before they have fully matured. If the pods are not harvested as edamame, they continue to mature into round, fully grown soybeans. Let's watch how soybeans are harvested. Areas where there's a wide temperature difference between morning and evening are said to be best suited to the cultivation of soybeans. November is the harvest season. Soybean pods are beaten with sticks to release the beans inside. Machines are too forceful. They bruise the skin and break too many of the beans. It's important not to damage them. We want to supply good beans. We want to eat good beans. <laughs> That's why we do it by hand. This painstaking labor produces nice round beans that positively glow. Next, any damaged beans are separated out. At peak harvest, the work lasts eight hours a day. It takes great patience. The sorted soybeans are finally dried on the veranda of the farmhouse. These premium grade domestically grown soybeans from a grower aspiring to the very best in flavor are now ready for the market. You can see they've got quite an array of different kinds of beans. Konnichiwa. These are your regular soybeans here, different size packs. But as you can see, there's a whole range of different kinds of beans. I was told recently that these are a kind of soybeans. Is that true? Yes, these are soybeans, a special variety of soybean that some people call grape beans. They're used for special New Year's dishes. When you boil them, they look just like grapes in terms of color. And are these made locally? Yes, they're cultivated in the Tamba area of Kyoto. The reason that beans are eaten at ceremonial times is there's, well, there's various reasons. Uh, one of them is a kind of play on words. Uh, the Japanese word for bean is mame. And there's another word, which is an adjective, mame, which means kind of industrious or diligent or conscientious, things like that, which are all qualities which are often applied to Japanese people. It makes you wonder whether they become like that because they eat a lot of beans or if there's any kind of connection. I don't know. Soybeans often feature in Japan's ancient customs and rites. The New Year is celebrated by eating a meal of dishes traditionally prepared especially for that holiday. One of these dishes is made of black soybeans. They symbolize a resolution to work diligently and stay healthy. In February, a festival is held on the day before the first day of spring on the lunar calendar. 
to welcome spring, a ritually stage to ward off bad luck. In it, people throw soybeans to drive away evil spirits. This is done because people believe that beans have a sacred power to expel demons. After driving away the evil spirits, each person eats the number of beans corresponding to his or her age. The aim is to stay free of disease and disaster through the year to come. Soybeans first appeared in Japan around 2,000 years ago. They came from China, where they originated. By around 1,300 years ago, processed soybean foods were being eaten in Japan. Japan had extensive interaction with China at the time, and products such as miso, soy sauce, and tofu, and the methods of making them, had come into the country. Soybeans began to be more widely cultivated around 700 years ago. As Buddhism spread, so did its prohibitions against eating meat. This spurred the development of vegetarian cooking. Ascetic monks had a simple diet. They typically ate meals... spreading the mixture on nori seaweed and frying it in oil. In spite of a limited assortment of ingredients, this sort of ingenuity led to the creation of many new soybean-based dishes. From the 18th century onwards, soy cuisine spread to the population in general. One cookbook published in 1782 presented 100 tofu delicacies. This book does in fact contain 100 tofu recipes and was written not by a culinary expert but by a man of letters. The tone is whimsical. It became a massive bestseller at a time when tofu was available cheaply to the general public. So what are the old recipes like? we had a few dishes made for us. This is called hailstone tofu. To make it, drained tofu is chopped into dice-sized cubes, which are immersed in water and rolled around on a bamboo sieve until they become rounded. These tofu balls are then fried in oil. The aroma and sweetness of tofu give this dish a sublime flavor. This one is called ice tofu. Crumbled tofu is sealed in agar and the whole thing is chilled to harden it. Syrup is poured on top to create a refreshing treat. Ingenuity brought forth a wide variety of dishes from this single ingredient and it all began with the Buddhist vegetarian meals of the 13th century. The 18th century saw the flowering of full-fledged tofu cuisine. Fast forward to modern times. Since the Second World War, soybean dishes have become even more popular. On the outskirts of cities, there has been a rapid increase in farmland planted with soybeans to harvest the young beans called edamame. Fresh edamame, as a companion for beer, became explosively popular among office workers around the 1960s. Soy products helped to fuel Japan's workforce during the country's era of booming economic growth. For centuries, the soybean has been enjoyed by people in Japan. Each generation has harnessed ingenuity to prepare soybeans in different ways. 
This is a restaurant that specializes in tofu cuisine. As you can see, I have a number of dishes laid out here in front of me. I'm not quite sure what they are. I'm hopefully going to find out now. And the chef of this restaurant is here with me. Konnichiwa. Konnichiwa. Um, can you please um, explain to me what these various dishes are? First of all, this is extra soft creamy tofu called oborodofu, made from white hylum soybeans. This one is a steamed egg custard dish, which uses soy milk. This is a fried tofu fritter, made with strained tofu, egg and ground fish paste. This is okara soybean leaves, wrapped in yuba tofu skin and grilled. Mm -hmm. And just all of these are made out of tofu, which is something that, I mean, people who like tofu, of course, uh, become fans of it. Some people don't see tofu, they think it's just tasteless. They need to come here and try this, I'm sure they would change their minds. But going back to that book that was written some 200 years ago, A Hundred Ways to, um, to Cook Tofu, it's that kind of spirit of inventiveness, I suppose, or invention, which still lives on today in cooking like this. Marvellous. OK, next we're going to meet a man who actually makes tofu. This profession, like many traditional crafts, is suffering from a lack of young people entering the field to take over from the old masters. But there are a few people starting up their own businesses. We're going to meet one of them. In the old days, tofu sellers would go around town selling tofu in the evening. There used to be many tofu sellers, but the number has declined to one-fifth of what it was 50 years ago. Why have so many left the business? They can't compete with the low prices of supermarkets. But one young man has bucked this trend by starting his own tofu shop. The Ryogoku district of Tokyo's Sumida Ward has been at the heart of traditional Tokyo for centuries. Yasuyuki Yokoi built his own tofu shop here from scratch. When Yokoi was in high school, he tried a certain kind of tofu and was astounded at how delicious it was. He immediately decided he would make tofu for a living. After graduating from university, he became an apprentice to a tofu maker in Kyoto. But the apprenticeship was tough. Temperature, humidity, the condition of the beans. Slight differences in any of these factors would influence the resulting tofu. He often made mistakes and wasted soybeans. Whenever that happened, I really felt inept. The mistakes were entirely my fault, of course. During his apprenticeship, Yokoi carried a notebook around with him wherever he went. Whenever he figured out what he had done wrong, or he saw something to remember, he would make a note for future reference. He was determined to create tofu of his own that was so delicious it would astound people. So Yokoi battled with the temperamental nature of soybeans day after day, in the heat and in the cold. Eight years later, having survived that gruelling apprenticeship, Yokoi finally opened his own tofu shop. He fulfilled his dream of making and selling tofu the old-fashioned way, dealing face to face with the customer in the neighbourhood where he was born and raised. The first thing that Yokoi learned in his apprenticeship was the importance of selecting soybeans. It's about the flavour balance. Also, the physical firmness of the tofu. Even the blend has to be adjusted as the seasons change. But even when using the same beans, the flavour of the tofu varies depending on who makes it. A fundamental in tofu making is the amount of water soaked into the beans. But the moisture content undergoes subtle changes, depending on air temperature, humidity, water temperature, 
and the condition of the beans. Yokoi attunes himself to the voice of the beans each day so as to understand their condition. This ability to listen to the beans is the crucial skill that Yokoi mastered during his eight years of apprenticeship. Yokoi is very particular about using as little coagulant as possible to set the torfin. He believes that it detracts from the inherent flavor of the soybeans. However, too little of the coagulant and the tofu will not set properly and be runny. How has today's tofu turned out? It seems that Yokoi is satisfied with this batch. More and more people in the neighborhood have learned of Yokoi's dedication to the occupation of tofu making, and he has a growing base of loyal customers. His wife, Kazuyo, runs the shop. We're keeping this place going. You're like a real boss now. Thank you. With the warm support of his old neighborhood, Yokoi continues to explore the tofu making tradition. For hundreds of years, shops selling traditional foods were a place where the whole community would interact. So you had the people making and preparing the food, dealing directly with their customers. And of course, you had a relationship of trust which could so easily break down if quality wasn't maintained. Ah, the good old days before convenience became a be-all and end-all for just about everything. I'll see you again next time.